Hey, good afternoon, our wonderful listeners. This is Mildred Badia with Malaprops, and I am very delighted to bring you Poetry of the July readers today. I will soon be introducing our three wonderful poets. And during the reading, feel free to type in the chat any question that you might have. And we have Michael Hetich and Jen Karetni, and then Sadiq Zukogi. And our first reader today is going to be Jen, and she will be reading from The Burning Where Breath Used to Be. This is how I will introduce her poetry book because you already have her bio, so I'm not going to mention the information that you have, but here is how I appreciated the writing, the poetry, and what my takeaway is. The burning where breath used to be. These are bodily poems that on the one hand investigate the human body and its pains, and on the other hand, contemporary American culture and all its travails today. The poet pokes the wound that's every teacher's nightmare, how to prepare for a school shooter in Sonnet. Examine the buildings, identify those that might be bulletproof and thus safe, then start stocking up for disaster. But how to prepare the body, how to protect flesh remains a mystery because we've not been trained to practice safety, but rather to bandage the throat after it's been cut. This is the school environment turned wild, the body betrayed while it betrays its own landscape and host. Jen. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. That was just such a wonderful introduction. And I am so grateful to be here reading for you at Malaprops and with Sadiq and Michael, um, both of whom I read with before, which is just a really nice kind of situation. Um, I'm going to read, as you said, from the burning where breath used to be. This is what it looks like. Um, I'm going to start with a poem that is sort of apropos for today or maybe tomorrow, um, since we are probably going to get a little bit of tropical weather. This is a poem that combines hurricane and um, a little bit of religion. Um, and it also about what we do with our buildings. Um, as you know, we've had the tragedy down here in Surfside and it just weighs heavily on everybody's mind. And we are really thinking about all of those lost people today. This is called For Urgent Prayer, Please Press One. Am I in need today? The Mercy Church robocaller from Marathon, epicenter where Irma slammed trailers and cars from the narrow loaf of land into marinas, like a waiter swiping crumbs from a table, wants me to admit it, to say, yes, I have no more strength except in this pointer finger to leave my print on the keypad and unlock the rest of this message. I could complain that I have run out of Diet Coke, that the mango trees have forgotten that they already stretch with the fetuses of fruit and bloom for the second time, throwing particles into the eyes of the wind, that the old dogs can no longer sleep through the night and begin to whine at 3 a.m., that the pool has become a place for an iguana the length of a crop bearing branch to garnish with salmonella. That this is the year my husband and I both turn new decades and still sink ankle shackled with debt. Or I could catalog our traumas, our long list of overripe injustices, the ways our bodies bred Ashkenazi pure for so many centuries have been past broken genes, how we have rooted them in the Edenic soil, the kind that smells already like vegetables before you even plant anything of our offspring. None of this is as exigent as weather turned into spirals, as if on a child's etch-a-sketch, the rotting takedown, the invasion of 
street rivers, no prophets can split to cross. Afterwards, the mosquitoes infused with infectious disease, laying invisible eggs in the cupped puddles of downed leaves and fronds. The families homeless, even as another hurricane season approaches. No, Mercy Church, I am not compelled toward the singular digit. And it's not only a matter of the wrong programming of surnames. It's more like I require two for reluctant prayer or three for an indifference utterance to Adonai or even four so that I can unsubscribe from this service, push five to opt out for the rest of my life, six if I am atheist, seven agnostic. When my husband and I were engaged and meeting with the rabbi, we asked if he could replace the word God in his ceremony with energy. He ate for his reaction. Storms have mostly now to do with what we have done, how much worse they get depending on what or who we burn. Press nine for the inevitable, or if you insist, wait on the line for the operator. This might take a while. That was a true story, by the way. My husband really did ask the rabbi to say energy instead of God, and um, that did not happen. God remained in the service. <laughs> so I'm gonna read this um, poem from my husband. It is sort of a love poem. Um, one of the reviewers who reviewed the book thought that this was very much a poem about cosmetic surgery, um, but it's not. It's actually about migraines. My husband shoots me with Botox 31 times in my forehead, the shallow dish of my temples, the nape of my neck, where as a younger man, he touched his tongue, a fencer's foil. He does not hold the syringe like a love letter or wield it like an apology. Although he says a quiet, I'm sorry, every time the needle pierces the cartilage under skin with an audible crunch. Fat, a loosely guarded prisoner, has long since escaped my face, muscles pulled tight from migraine after migraine. I follow his directions to look up, down, wrinkle my forehead like a chow so that he can measure where the nerves are, avoid making my eyelids droop more than they already do. He assures me the puncture marks will fade, the medicine diffuse block the transfer of pain, lengthen the staccato of light. Three decades ago, he practiced tapping my joints as if they were ice with a rubber hammer, thumped my ribs, dug under bone for my organs and lymph nodes. Now I reap expertise, fanned by his trajectory as he wasps around me, and I wait, still within this vortex, to be stung and stung and stung. This is a poem I like to read um, during readings. There's a large number of poems in this book about my brother who passed away. And this one is about a day like today, especially down here in Miami when it was very hot and we got up to a lot of mischief during the summer times. This is called Plexiglass Suburbia, and it is a golden shovel after William Carlos Williams, and I think you'll hear the end words that are the actual entire poem. In the summertime, when the New Jersey humidity is so thick, it can be kneaded like dough, and there isn't much to do besides taunt and taunted. Everything depends on making the daredevil club. Admittance is granted upon a feat of such physical audacity that even a Spartan, even a boy like my brother, cannot deny the legacy of red, stippled scars it will surely leave behind, the wheelbarrow of flesh and courage that can be carted away in equal glazed measures from the site. My turn. At the top of North Ashby, with a neon orange skateboard, no one knows how to ride, in rain that has been falling for days, collecting in the potholes, the water rubicund with clay from half-built housing developments beside our cul-de-sac. In my imagination, I crouch and glide, but in the end, I sit, 
knees to chest and cast off, an unguided blur of white. It's no use. I arrive clean and whole to be cast down with chickens. This next poem is also about childhood. Um, we live next to a little league field that was dug out from um, shale and rocks and they kept those big piles of rocks all around this place where children would play and they would just tell us, don't go in there. Um, and of course, when you tell a child to do something or not to do something, they are going to do it. So we would play on those piles of rocks all the time. And um, one day, of course, I got hit with one of them and it left me a scar on my face for the rest of my life. This is called Congressional Complex. I could not sting like a bee or float like a butterfly, though I did learn to throw a punch from my trunk, not my wrist, after our father taught my sister. A shadow boxer, a flyweight, I followed her from the split level house to the little league where she was the first girl to play. Another way for the other gender to spend a lengthening spring afternoon. Formed from former gravel pits, the fields were shielded to the right by hills of shale and river rocks, rising over the stand of pin-boned pines we generously called the woods. We were warned away from here. Horses wouldn't be able to drag us out were we to fall under an avalanche of these stones. But no one advised a boy not to toss them as flirtations, which is how one landed on my lip, struck dumb, it spurted into a bucket, empty of baseballs, that I brought home. Even after surgery, I swallowed his name like blood to wear the fist he made me for life. I'm gonna read one more um, from this book and then I'm gonna close with just two new poems from my work in progress before I hand it over. This is called Nobody Dies Because They Don't Have Access to Healthcare, which is a quote from a Republican representative in Idaho. Nobody knows about how the fingers of fog have blown the fuses of her synapses until the email has and returned, the form submitted incorrectly, the name misspelled but published anyway. Even her conversation has retractions most days. Then nobody can't find the words she wants and substitutes the silence of a search party whose communication is the weak stuttering of drugstore flashlights. But what is there any way to say? A poorly balanced budget of cellular call and response, toxic to herself. Nobody only pre-exists before what is not likely to be a grand exit, but the kind few notice, like the melting of those sneaky slivers of ice in a dry martini. Nobody's digestive organs have joined a union <clears throat> to limit the hours they want to work. Nobody's muscles and joints resist like dogs who think their humans are on the other side of the door, who have not really left and are up to playing some sort of cruel trick. But it's a matter of willpower, <clears throat> healthy eating, giving up the Diet Coke, more water, says everybody nobody meets, who all recommend hot yoga as correct as House Republicans. Tomorrow, it's time to take that advice instead of pills, invest in class pass rather than Blue Cross Blue Shield, and believe that in decades, nobody will still be posing in the light steam awash with joy. Look at her now, already, how nobody sweats and laughs. So I've been writing a work in progress with a new form that I've invented. It's called the American Sentence Acrostic. And it takes an American sentence, which is a 17 syllable sentence um, defined by Allen Ginsberg. And it uses it as an acrostic um, for a poem. So each word of the sentence begins a line of the poem. And I'm gonna read two of these. I've written 26 of them um, for one section of the book. The first is called Scenes from an Indonesian Village Where Flooding Hits a Nearby Dye Factory, Turning the Water Red. And the American sentence is Getting on my red soles, I catwalk the runway of this apocalypse. 
getting waist deep in the bloodletting, groceries and laundry parked on sodden heads. The villagers are accustomed to this monthly ritual. My neighborhood submerges too, but not in so many incoming waves of red as if the earth itself were menstruating, staining skin from bare soles to pubic bones. Downhill from the Tequesta Indian burial mound, I wade through the runoff of artifact and colonized debris, mating peacocks catwalk next to me. In Jengat, a construction of motorbikes patterns the river balanced as cranes. Next moon, the batik factory will gild this runway the color of urine or gold, depending on your fate, whether it's that of cynics or disciples, and after that, a turquoise or amethyst that will tessellate this land the way wax pants it on fabric. Here by Biscayne Bay, a red tide apocalypse isn't so precious, but its unpronged setting is just as easy to lose. And this last one is called, the opossum is a marsupial. The American sentence is, zombie minded, we are the past knowing, post removal, dreaming generation. The opossum is a marsupial zombie, stumbling under the slog of sun, stealthy in spirit with the moon. We never minded them nesting under the deck or snoozing in the mondo grass, even though we sometimes had to rest them from our dogs, stiff and drooling they are and scared, bowels empty, eyes and mouth open as a contemporary floor plan. The tonic immobility as complete as it is involuntary. Still, we made a mistake in the recent past. Believing one truly dead, we grabbed her tangle of babies from her pouch. Despite knowing we would have to raise this cluster of snouts on ticks and palmetto buds. But post removal, hours later, she was gone. Possums can be injured, bones broken in this dreaming state, but we only stole what was rightfully hers, our hands in her insensate womb, generation of liberators signaling virtue, rescuing what had been doing fine without us. Thank you so much. It was so it was such an honor being here. You're very welcome. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful reading. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our second reader, Michael Hetich. And he's going to be reading from his latest book, The Mica Mine. And this is how I will introduce Michael through his poetry. These are poems of sustenance filled with hope that comes from creation and creating, if not a better world, then better imagined lives through fantastical day-to-day -day rituals that make daily living a wonderful miracle. These rituals include gathering storms, smelling the first raindrops, walking while naked as if in meditation, singing to moths, then gathering their dead and saving them in chairs. Some nights watching silent movies or holding a tadpole in one's cupped hands, only to set it back into water moments later. There's charm, a sureness and devotion to life that's achingly beautiful. The characters in these poems dance and tell themselves stories that lead into paths larger than themselves. They invite us to listen, to really hear the songs of things buried deep under, like roots of ox, like water dripping in caves for hundreds of years, like birds in migration, the natural world teeming with life and its own language that summons us through the poet to return to the animal we were before we were born to the elements that watch over us like angels or bats, like fireflies, so that we can be saved. Michael, you're very welcome. I was on mute. Thank you, Mildred. That is beautiful. Thank you so much. 
I'm going to read, uh, well, it's also, I want to say before I start reading, I want, it's very good to read with Jen again and Sadiq, who I've never read with, but I look forward to hearing. I'm going to start with two new poems and then read uh, for 10 minutes or a little, little more uh, from the, the mic of mine. And the first poem I'm going to read is called Core. The hawk in the white pine shivers, hunched into itself like a state of being we might think had vanished if we've been playing too long with our gadgets or making arrangements to assure our perfect happiness sometime in the future. The wind that tossed cut down trees remains a ghost inside our furniture, like the antique notion of a soul and ancient tides drew the swirls and the stones that line our paths. Scars that mark the seasons our ancestors lived, etched like tree rings into the secrets we don't even know we're keeping. A dream that woke us to forget, or blue that dazzles the sky as only nothing can do in the morning. Another kind of silence. Sometimes the world grows louder, you realize, just as the day falls still. And insects whose names you'll never know start screaming and laughing, scraping their wings, then falling silent. It's as though there were some technology that could capture your dreams and throw them on a screen to show, show you to yourself and confuse you more deeply. You who are not alone, but live in solitude, never seeing anyone but yourself, even when you're talking with your friends and family, even when you're moving through a crowd, thinking everything is wild at its core, even half asleep evenings in front of the TV, even listless afternoons shopping for knickknacks or food. And food is especially wild. Just think of all those apples and grains of rice. Just think of that wine ripening as grapes in the bright sun of some foreign country. The bees and even the bats zigzagging through the gloaming, singing as they feast. Another kind of silence. Music your ears are not built to hear, like the roots of those trees humming as they soak up the puddles that have deepened for so many days, you hardly remember how the sunlight feels on your body, how it makes you squint and see things differently, the way it makes everything waver and shimmer like a mirage you walk toward, never arriving. Okay, now to this book. The mic of mine. I'm going to start with the beginning and read the very first poem in the book, which is called The Legacy. All morning, I've been collecting stones, lugging them down from the woods to my garden, where I spread them out on the ground to admire their shapes and glinting mica. Then, as the afternoon sun warms us, I fill a bucket with water and scrub them. It takes until evening. When I grow tired, I leave the stones drying, go inside, pour some wine, and sit down to eat. My wife and I watch TV and sit quietly together. Then we go to bed and hug each other chastely through the night. Tomorrow, I'll carry each stone back into the woods and lay it gently on the earth where I found it, so no one else will know. Sky. Who took the chance to leave home with only the clothes she was wearing and someone else's name? Who took the chance to sleep without a blanket in the litter-filled woods by the highway in the rain? Who closed her eyes and slept while the delicate animals sniffed her and ravenous insects by the millions slipped under her skin as she mumbled a little in her dream? Did no one look for her? 
Someone walks barefoot through the city in the dark, a delicate woman with aching teeth whose bones have been arranged like kindling to burn. We wake to the smell of smoke and look up at the sky. This poem is called, I Wake. I wake in the middle of the night to something moving across the porch outside our bedroom, sliding furniture around and muttering. It's raining, but I'm sure I hear footsteps. So I hold myself still. The sprigs of flowering dogwood my wife has collected glow in the moonlight by the window. She snores peacefully beside me. I'm naked. Today, a red-tailed hawk swooped across our garden to vanish in the woods before I was sure what I saw, so I didn't say anything. Later, we had dinner with a friend who's grown suddenly old. And as we said our goodbyes, she told us again about the day her husband left her out of the blue when her adult children were toddlers. It hasn't stopped hurting, she said as she closed her front door. Driving home, I noticed my wife was crying, face turned to the window. I thought of pulling over, reaching out, asking her to tell me what was wrong. But that road is difficult to follow at night. And I wasn't even sure she was crying after all, when I looked over again. So I drove on in silence, keeping my eyes on the road, respecting that darkness. The center of this book is a long poem called This Melody. It's a 56 uh, part poem. So um, of course, I'm not going to read all the 56 parts, but I would like to read about four of them just to give you a sense of how the poem moves. I did the poem improvisationally, basically wrote the wrote 100 of these and then cut it back to 50, the 56 that I felt resonated with each other, rhymed with each other, made sense somehow when they were put in sequence with each other. I don't think that you'll get a sense of that sequence, but I think uh, I want to try to give you a sense of how the poems sing as they move uh, through their process. I'm not going to read the numbers, but um, I'm going to start with the first one and end with the last one. So it goes like this, this melody. This melody moved through our bodies and taught us not to think, which taught us to open our bodies to the grass at the edge of those unexplained woods where the deer stood without names, quivering and taught us to lie down and open ourselves and learn to sleep again like the boulders. For generations, their dead were buried on top of each other like mica flecks or wounds. We think they knew the dead still dream for years beyond their lives. We think they knew dreams push up upward like stones do toward the light while roots push deeper into darkness. Imagine dreams rising from the old dead through the new. Hummingbird wings woven like veils across their empty eyes. All day, the smell of rain drenched boulders. And when I moved, something moved in the distance, something wild off beyond the trees. Touch me deeper, she said, than language, and we will turn to ash together, naked before each other, alive in the strangeness of burning. And then the final poem of this sequence way back five, 50 more 50 poems away uh, bodies frozen for thousands of years are discovered some of whom still have faces and tongues some of whom still have their innards one newly thawed body had foot-long fingernails another was covered in his own hair which had pushed through the woof and weave of his tunic and cottoned him like a cocoon. 
some of the stories they told, some of the food they ate, whatever songs they sang. She was wearing a necklace of finely carved shells a thousand miles from the sea. Do you see me at all? My wife asked last night before bed, but I think I was already sleeping. So that might give you a sense of the way the poem works. I wish I could uh, give you a, great, a better sense because just a little snippet like that doesn't give, what I'm, doesn't give you much of a sense of what I'm after there. Now in the third section of the book, I also uh, improvised mostly and tried not to revise a great deal. Uh, and an example of the poems from that, book, that part of the book, uh, here's an example, uh, is called Another Animal. And it goes like this. <clears throat> Forget about forgiveness. There's another kind of animal at your door. So you don't need to have, you don't have to make up lists and fancy equations to impress the family still sleeping in the house behind you. There are many ways to step outside and just as many to step back and let that animal enter yawning and asking for coffee. There are many ways of being half dressed in your nakedness as you stand in the morning with all the little birds sleeping in your ears and all the perfect creatures sleeping now inside the bleeding wound no suture could mend. It's like a river that spills beyond its banks, rushes to a flood, then subsides into itself again. That animal is nothing like a pet, although you feed it from a bowl, although you take it for walks and let it curl up at your feet at night, except when it moves around outside and carries the dark in its fur as it shakes itself like a dusty rag. It whimpers as it sleeps while you listen to the life that is only partly yours breathing inside you. But this animal would save you. If the house were to fall down around you, even if you were dead inside, it would save you. Even if that meant it would die too, it would save you, or at least it would try to. It doesn't have a name, but it's all yours. Open your door now, stand back and let it in. And the, for la the, the fourth section of the book uh, contains what I would call more intimate poems, more poems about relationship uh, with my family. Uh, and uh, I think the final poem I'm gonna read is this one, which is called The Skinny Dip, which is basically, uh, I would say a portrait of my wife and, and, and me, uh, my wife and I taking a walk um, in the woods around our house. having a conversation as we do it. The skinny dip. After she wonders how psychic wounds move like genetics from parent to child, he muses on the way a field of boulders dances without moving for millions of years. And after they've silenced their breaths to listen to a chirping in the undergrowth, they wonder how quickly their senses might sharpen if they bushwhacked off the trail into the deep woods to let themselves get lost, which reminds them of people they've loved and lost and prompts reminiscences they both know by heart, paths they might follow through the dark toward each other. And when they come to a bend in the river where a waterfall fills a dark pool, he undresses and slips in, yelping. She laughs at his shrieking nakedness, then takes off her own clothes to stand, <clears throat> leaning toward him, hands extended, just in case. Thank you. Very wonderful to read for you all, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for listening. You're welcome, Michael. Thank you so much for that wonderful reading. And our listeners out there, feel free to type in the chat questions that you may have for the poets, uh, because at the end, we are going to have very few minutes to respond to the questions. And right now, I have the pleasure of introducing our third poet, Sadiq 
Zukogi. And his book, Your Crib, My Kibla, is what he'll be reading from today and maybe a few other poems from elsewhere. But here is how I have loved reading this book and how the book helps us uh, deal with grief. So it's part elegy, part lyrical memoir. The poems in this collection celebrate life as much as they mourn it. The poet dives into liminal spaces of the afterlife and begins a new dialogue with God and his daughter purposed to bring her back into his body. And he does through prayer and by carrying the weight of grief that refuses to be laid down. He sees her even in places he's not looking, in a teacup, in a wine glass, in everything he touches. She appears everywhere, especially in stars and flowers, lovely and tender, fragile and transient. He holds onto her toes as long as she haunts him, as long as he urgently demands her presence. Had he known she would leave too soon, he would have stayed with her toes forever in his hands. In memory, the poet finds mirrors to see in his face, her body, a love language that transcends the threshold of death. Sadiq, you're welcome. Um, thank you so much, um, Mildred, for that um, wonderful introduction um, and also for the space to share poems. Um, Jen, um, nice to meet with you again. Um, and um, Michael, both of you, just, um, yeah, um, did that to me. Um, thank you. So the first poem that I would read um, is, is is incidentally the, the last one that I always read, um, which is one year after. So um, I'm gonna kickstart this with that and switch on the time. One year after. Today is a year since the earth opened its mouth to the size of your body and swallowed. Like a ghost, I am learning to walk the earth without my body. Regret, a rosary wrapped around my wrist, leads me away from the universe's favor. If death is truly everywhere on earth, where could I have hidden you from its grasp? Perhaps behind a star that shines every 500 years, the shaft of sorrow like sunlight striking the ground where I stand. God knows that I am not perfect, but I've found a pearl in loving you. Each time in the swelling vapor of love I hold you, blended into the rainbow, marking its body on the skyline. The world stops spinning. Instead, a bubble grows over it, and time cannot exert itself on us. The next poem that I would read is titled, Shattered. A raven song echoes against a wall where the back of a tree is a rough marble face, a place to put his tongue so it says what needs to be heard. Nothing is sustained inside his mouth but stories, stories that dip in everything looking for light inside the raven's mouth. Steeped in the dense waters of morning, sadness runs like a white horse deep into the gravity human eyes have never touched until it scratches the place where a soul is weak, where a flaw is most visible, where light fills his bones until light and darkness collapse into each other. The mind turns into a hem, a black hole where escape is a prayer that is never answered. Prayer is now the dark side of light, a night so impenetrable, heavy, with a silence that tears the neighborhood, his skin, 
his entire body. Next poem I'd read is titled The Gown. Um, this, this is a very difficult poem for me to read. Um, um, there's um, a white gown that uh, my mom sewed for me. And on the day that she died, I was looking especially beautiful. And for that reason, I blamed this gown. Um, and so the poem is in response to that particular guilt. The gown. He looked at his gown, felt like ripping it off. In the way it heavies on his skin, the whole weight of the loss that comes, something inside the body, a primordial black hole goes out his soul. The cloth, like rarefied muscles, rupture bones, a, a giant snake squeezing his edging into an opening. He resents this gown. It is hot inside, almost as if dressed in a furnace and his skin streaked with lines of throbs, throbs of pain, his heart will remain the same. Never will it hike down this agony. He wishes he could lie on through this grief without the enfeeblement that comes from wearing a little leaf around his waist and sit on his ears and not hear anything. Anyone goggles on the ache to crack deeper until it grasps where the daisies lies. He envies his grief, dreams to go into himself and lie down close to his child. He wants to rip his clothes, skin, and see her robed in a plaid gown, her hair ponytailed, raising her leg by pulling her toes. His heart is a train packed with commuters. The quietness that rises among all that noise drowns him. Her death is inside their voices, inside the gown, inside all the things he finds deterring. The next poem that I'll read is titled Strain. He shifted his body from the fragment of the world where all the atoms of your departure are sustained, your grave, his agony, the politin bark brimming with breast milk. He can't break away from the things that remind him you are gone. The napkin they used to wipe your face after you ate, he tucked behind his bag after your funeral. He stretches, swallowing all the screams in the earth with limbs still devoted to memory. The night is solid on his skin. His stomach growls in a broken voice, trapped in a loop he can bear no more. The brink, where the world becomes custodial with barbed wires that rend its nook into small rooms he cannot enter. So long in the dark, pupils adjust to a new gloom and his hands become eyes, leading him through the walls to a doorknob. It's been a month since you left. He wishes he could step into your mother's prayers and swap it with the harvest of his silence. The next poem I'd read is titled Shihada. Today, Baha is not dead. Her tears reveal deep love for him. He prays his daughter's hands turn the sponge that would wash his corpse. The rite of passage pressed into her forehead, a prayer mark from birth. In this dream state, he is dying. She passes on the shahada into his mouth after her tongue formed the words, a scrum of flowers beside her knees, hands lift toward the sky as if she is trying to open a doorway. His body lips slips into the bowl as he imbibes the water she spit Quran verses into. He floats when she casts curse or see you against his eyes. Today, Baha is not dead. She is the shield that repels a surface of darkness from owning his body, an eel out of mud water.
The next poem that I'll read is titled Memories by the Sea. Imagine a forlorn child conceive the sun that rouses the mouth of the universe. Imagine it disappearing into the throbbing throat of night. Imagine the dark seams, thick treads that bind voices to a giant bolt of silence. Imagine him rubbing his fingers across your picture, trying to close your lips with words as you wander off into the horizon. Imagine your face, still a sky peering down into his mind. Now, imagine the sun as reverie, and there by a sea, he's leaning to fetch a bit of that firmament. Imagine this, when his mother says your shadow, it but lambs inside his body. A seashell swallows the wave back into its depth. Imagine looking deeply until his reflection convinces you you can exist as a fraction outside his corners. Imagine you're a star trancing in his thoughts. Imagine he disposed those thoughts about you in more thoughts about you. Imagine each time you feel like forgetting something about him, even if insignificant. Imagine glaring the blue zenith bordered in a surface mud by tides until the memory split apart by the sea reassembles like a solved puzzle picture. How he wishes you imitate that multiplicity and grow into the right places that would hold you whole. He hears the night holds on to your voice like a basket finally able to hold on water. Imagine he presses his feet against wet sand and slip through a footprint. Here is a mystery close to the shoreline, a portal. Here's the distance, the vast sea between your bodies, your voice still a light wading through the dark beyond the throes of suppression. Imagine, imagine, imagine how you'd communicate from here on. Grieving is the only way he speaks of nothing. The next poem that I would read is titled Measuring the Length of Grief by the Length of a River. In the sovereignty of night, I relieve the days of being your father. I caught the urge of sliding into a dream, indulging that fantasy of fatherhood, listening to your heartbeat. I once woke up the world with my excitement. And if this yearning could now wake you up, once you wake, the world you find will be a bit more impaired than the one you left. And me swallowed in the great rust of morning, where everybody whose lives you've touched has earplugs to shut down themselves from one another. Child, my mother says your body shortens the distance between God and me, a bridge scrawled from my doorstep into paradise. Perhaps it's true. Every day I whip in her presence, she presses those words into my ears until a smile appears on my face and then she crumbles into her own tears as if the, the smile on my face was a wound that scars her attempt at happiness. Each time I think about you now, I go into the bathroom to lean against the mirror and cry. Most times the mirror feels like your body, sometimes like a ghost or a light of illusion along a forsaken river. Sometimes I think your memory is a sky crumbling onto its own clouds and the blue sky reminds me of my mother and her faint strength. I am rooted in what ruptures, a ghost looking for its body played in eternal voyage, a cyclical track around the masjid. At the entrance of night, your body is a bright artifact hang, hanging on the minaret. The next poem that I'll read is titled Ummi, and this is a poem in the voice of um, the deceased child in celebration of her own mother. Ummi, 
Each time you pray, your tongue wrestles with your feet to say the 99 names of a non-talking God that never answers when catechized to return the dead, not even when the names are tattooed behind his ears as a voice calling a stone deaf, who seems to say, I am a bit deaf, so you'd have to speak up. If silence were a language prancing in a hand-carved wood doll, what words would the world hear? There, Ummi, each time sorrow weakens your knees in subdued and the prayer you offer questions the composer instead of admonishing. There is nothing as beautiful as you weaving a wreath in praise of my body. But because your shadow is alive with grief, no air can stop your lungs from gasping for more air. Where pieces of father's blues levitate like blood from a skin cut open in space. You're counting years by the number of family members that have fallen into the part of earth only seen when you look into the moon. What does it mean to be outside a clock, outside its fingers? Sometimes, I come to the house as a wind and ring the doorbell. When you open the door, your body is in my face. I fill my nose with your smell. If you ask me, no one deserves more praise than the hands bleeding of my absence as they mix play dough for my brother or as they construct cardboard papers into houses no one could live in beside the memory you stoke into making them. If silence were a language prancing out of a shadow's mouth, what would be heard in your muffled prayers, anointed with a tinge of your ire? I know you often blame yourself, but death wasn't in your breast milk, nor inside anything you fed me. You wonder if God hears your voice on me. I hear you. And the last poem that I'll read is titled, At Your Grave I Am Reminded of the Day You Were Born. After Subhi, the night wears off from my eyes as dawn approached and laid soft fingers on the prayer mat. By then I could see the position of my own hands, balled together, my plea for your safe arrival handed to God like some gift. Throughout the night, my prayer beat like a track field where my tomb runs many laps. I have learned to interpret the nurse's expression at intervals. In CMs, the sizes of your mother's second mouth widening enough for an entry. Before going to the mosque, I placed my ear on the wall of the delivery room, heard so many baby cries, wondered which one was you. If at all you were there, I heard so many women cry out in pain, one wailing, swallowing the other, overlapping, confusing me, which one was your mother's. The more I heard Mother's mourn, the closer I thought you were to come in. Before I went to pray, out from her womb, a woman pushed a baby who refused to let air into its lungs. Another used up her last breath to push hers only halfway. I inherited my mother's fear and anxiety. My agitated mind turned into a river that lost its shape to an eternal current. The prayer I give to God, a collection of words half spoken, muffled into each other like screams of the laboring women. Back in the hallway, my body felt as light as my shadow. And I pondered how you would come, how beautiful you would grow. Peddling back on this memory, like the iridescent wings of a moth fading out as I opened my palms from where it had been caught. After the first rain, your body has geared into a tulip. Thank you so much um, for the opportunity to share this poems with you. 
um, and um, thank you for listening. You're welcome. That was powerful. Thank you so much, Sadiq. And um, I realize we don't actually have that much time for questions. And I appreciate uh, today's uh, poets. Thank you so much, Jen Karitnik. Thank you so much, Michael Hetich. And thank you so much, Sadiq Zukogi, for sharing your work with us. There is one question though that can be answered quickly. And this is from Gianna Russo, who would like to know the American sentence acrostic form that Jane mentioned. So uh, Jane, if you could. Yes, what's the question? Uh, the, uh, Jenna would like to know the American sentence acrostic form. Okay, so this is a form I invented um, and you first write an American sentence, which is a 17 syllable sentence. And that's something that Allen Ginsberg created in response to the haiku. And then you use that sentence as an acrostic, um, which means you use it vertically. Every word starts a line in the poem going down the page. And come up with some very interesting poems. Um, I did that 20, I've done it, yeah, like actually 32 or 34 times. My second book um, is actually called American Sentencing. It's where I started using the form but I made a conscious decision to write my, my sixth full length book um, in that form deliberately throughout um, as an experiment. So, um, but please use it. It's, it's really fun. It takes you syntactically and, and diction wise to very different places. And when you're bored, you can find, you can find an American sentence or you can write one. So like a haiku, it's a completely different poem and then you write another poem from it. Wonderful, thank you so much. And we will end today's event here and next August, it's going to be August 1st. I would like to invite you and all our listeners to the next poetry event. It will take place again, usual time, 3 p.m. every first Sunday of the month. So I look forward to seeing you on August 1st uh, support Mala Probes, uh, purchase some of the books that are on the links that we usually send out to you. And thank you so much for sharing your afternoon with us. My name is Mildred Barrier. I look forward to seeing you again August 1st. Have a wonderful day. Celebrate 4th of July. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody.